I have big hopes for 2024. I think we're, we're in for a pretty challenging year for ESG as a whole. I think where we've got to in 2023 has been regulations are coming into place. They've sort of set expectations at a very high and a very broad level. What we do not have yet is the how-to, the implementation pieces. And I think what we can expect to see in 2024 is two things. One is from a reg perspective, more engagement from the regulators and policymakers as to how to actually become more granular and more specific with this. But also from the private sector especially, a lot of feedback as to why these regulations are, are not working for, for many of them. What sort of subjects are we focusing on? I think climate change has been done and most people are relatively comfortable with what they're doing on climate change. I think where the real pressure points will be and where the emphasis would likely be required is on understanding the social issues and the biodiversity issues. Um, and these are very location specific. That gives us one increased advantage, which is if we start to look at what the regulations are, are asking, supply chains, a granular understanding of your supply chains, what does that mean? If you start to look at what is your impact globally, you get, to, you get a good understanding of it. And moving into a more location-based conversation can actually be really fruitful for those discussions. Um, just to close it off, I do think the geopolitics of, of today are creating a challenging environment for ESG more generally. You're starting to see internal governance actually being, being pushed, pushed to, the, to its limits. Should you be acting in one way for one country and another for another country? I think those sort of objective views on ESG are being tested, and it would be great to see how companies respond to that in the next year, because I think it's something that will define ultimately whether or not ESG is something that, that is, is, is something that these companies are capable of actually including in their, in their reporting and financial decision making in a much more substantial way, thinking longer term rather than necessarily immediate short terms. One disclaimer first, I am the advisor to the TNFD, okay. but I promise you my opinion on this is not going to be a biased one. Um, so the TNFD I really hope does get a little bit more adoption. I think the challenge for most will be, and I know that the team at TNFD are also aware of this, is that actually you are asking for voluntary disclosures without necessarily having the incentive for them. And we've seen what, what, that ha what happened when TCFD was initially adopted by everybody openly was there's a series of litigation that followed, a series of challenge, and for those who tried to do good, it, was, it wasn't a reward system, it was a, it, was a carrot, it was a stick rather than carrot approach. Where I think we need to get to is a point of actually challenging the framework of TNFT to say, does this work for corporate reporting purposes? I think once companies are comfortable with what they are having to collect, what they're having to report on, the impact and dependencies in a more articulate way, once they're comfortable that it lines up with regulation that's otherwise coming, so it's not additional to, but it's actually complementary to. And we've seen this. We've seen this through the IFRS and the ESRS now already that they are starting to align with the TNFT. You will start to see more adoption, and the adoption will, will start to pick up pace. I think there is enough runway right now for TNFT to be credibly adopted by many organizations in the next few years. And I think TNFD is encouraging that as well um, as part of its framework is to figure it out and then start reporting on it. That's the element which I'm encouraged by. But actually, present day, will we suddenly start seeing every organization signing up to it, the same way we saw TCFD? I think from, from lessons learned in the past, it may be a quieter approach rather than a loud approach to, to aligning with, with the requirements of TNFD. Let's start with a comparative view. I think the, the reality is what we have seen very vocally represented and presented in the US, the red state, blue state, this polarization conversation, has already finding its way into Europe. It's, it's maybe not as obviously red state, blue state, because these are certain countries within uh, the union that, is, that are having these discussions. We've already seen, and I say the union, I'm also gonna add UK into this conversation, because let's start with the UK. You saw the U-turn take place on, on its own green commitments and policies. You're starting to see a, a pushback in France. You're starting to see a pushback in other jurisdictions across the continent. Now, does this mean that we're going to see less ESG? I think that's probably the more fundamental question. And the reason I say that is just because you're hearing pushback against ESG does not mean that ESG stops happening. In fact, what it probably means is that ESG is happening quieter, somewhere in the shadows. But I can assure you, um, most, most organizations are saying it still needs to happen. 
a need, not want. I think that's the important part. This is driven by a few things. From the private sector's perspective, you are looking at long-term sustainability of your business. You're also looking at short-term returns. And the combination of the two means you need to have more robust supply chains. You need to have a, more of your risks under control and managed. And you need to understand what the impacts of your, or what the dependencies rather of your business are on the environment in which you operate. On all of those fronts, leaving this because there's backlash, I think would be a risk to most businesses and the one that they already appreciate. So the question really is, how much pressure is on the business to report what they're doing as opposed to not? I think I'm going to start with something that was said on the panel, which was don't publish a 250-page report. I think the risk we always face, and as a lawyer, I'm equally guilty of this because we caveat everything. We try to explain a lot of things. And what that typically does is we make one point and then have five pages of notes about why that point is the way it is. If you are going to add context, and I think you should, the context needs to be relevant, and the context does not need to operate as a disclaimer. So the context is justifying a decision, is not disclaiming why you've not done something else. I think the difference is very important.